Gentlemen, this is a football. Vince Lombardi very famously said that in 1961. In uh, earlier, the previous Super Bowl, they had lost in the last, uh, at the end of the game, they lost the Super Bowl. And so at training camp the very next season, he gets all the team together, and the very th first thing is he holds up a football and says, gentlemen, this is a football. Now, you're talking to professional athletes who play football for a living. Not only did he do that, he proceeded in that, in that uh, training camp to read through every single play they did. Things that they knew. One, one, one player even joked saying, coach, you're going too fast. Even though they already know the plays because they've been, they're professionals, you know. Um, and so what he did there was remind people of the fundamentals of the game. If you're going to be champions, you have to know the basics to excel. That's not only true of Vince Lombardi. Kobe Bryant is known as one of the most fundam fundamentally sound basketball players. And he's also known as one of the greatest. And that's, there's, no, um, there's no wonder why those two things correlate. Because if you're very sound in your footwork and your fundamentals of the game, of basketball, then you'll, you'll play better than, you, than if you didn't. You can just compare LeBron's footwork to Kobe Bryant's footwork and know that, I mean, you know. So anyways, well, LeBron's a Laker now, so. John Wooden, John Wooden as he coached. Do you know that when John Wooden coached UCLA basketball, he even taught, he taught, he went to the basics of even how to put your socks on and how to tie your shoes as he's coaching college basketball players. And John Wooden had one of the most impressive runs as a college basketball coach. So some people call this the hidden power of mastering the fundamentals. The hidden power of mastering the fundamentals. Not merely assuming it, that you already know what it is, but, but mastering the fundamentals. So, in the spirit of Vince Lombardi, gentlemen, this is a church. This is a church. What is a church? Do we even know what we're talking about when we say we are pastors of a church? What is a local church? This is, well, this is a picture of, to be more accurate, this is a picture of a local church. This is a local church. Mark Sasser, now this is, I, I debated whether to read this quote because it's very sharp and, and uh, maybe even borderline, it could come off as self-righteous and arrogant, but I think it's effective, so I'm going to read it anyways, and hopefully I could dig myself out of the pit, the pit of being discouraging in this um, talk. Mark Sasser wrote this. He's from Sovereign Grace Churches, but he, he was talking, there's a polity, church polity um, discussion with Jonathan Lehman and Carl Truman at Westminster Seminary. The Vimeo videos are online if you want to see them, except for Carl Truman's. I don't know why it's gone, but anyways, he says this in that, in that lecture. Elders have a particular response, a particular obligation to study polity deeply. If you do not have extensive biblically grounded convictions about polity, you're obviously unqualified to serve as an elder in any church because you literally don't know what you're doing. It is polity that tells you what an elder is, what is the scope of his authority and responsibility, and to whom he is accountable. He goes on to talk about even church members need to know and that they should not be held more by feelings, but rather they should be held by principles. He answers the objection, well, what about the focus on the gospel? Aren't we supposed to focus on the gospel and be centered on the gospel? He says, yes, of course, yes. But you can't be, quote, you can't be a gospel man without being a church man because Christ died and he purchased the body, the body of Christ, the church. You can't be a gospel man without being a church man and you can't be a church man without polity. So one of my uh, pastoral interns here, uh, Ross, he's right over there. Ross, raise your hand so people know who you are. Get to meet Ross. Um, he asked yesterday, do you have to know what a church is to be a good pastor? And so um, we said, yes. <laughs> um, does a fisherman need to know what a fish is if he's going to be a good fisherman? Or does a shepherd need to know what sheep is to be a good shepherd? Um, yes, you would need to know. So understanding the definition of a local church is so important, not only for pastors, but for Christians. How you define the local church literally affects how you pastor, and it affects how you encourage your people to practice living as a local church. When, 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 if I took any of your church members and said, what, is, what, is, what are you doing here? 
What's your job? Like, what are you trying to do as a member of this church? They would tell me what they have been discipled by you in your functional definition of what you think a local church is. Whether you've explicitly stated it or not, you function on a definition of local church, it comes out in the way you pastor, and if I ask them what is a church and what is your responsibility to each other, their answer would be the, your functional definition, whether you've actually stated it or not. It's very important. It might be, I might go so far, if I was gonna be extreme to say, it might be the single most important aspect. How you define local church might be the single most important aspect of a person's life echoing into eternity, because if, if you wanna make your life count for eternity, it's in making disciples and glorifying Christ, right? And the machine or the mechanism God has given to Christians to do that, to invest their lives for his glory, not just individually, but in, in terms of overall impact, it's through the local church, equipping them for their personal ministry and them joining with the church for their corporate ministry. So when the Bible uses the word church, it usually refers to, sometimes it refer, refers to universal church, all Christians everywhere for all time, that's Wayne Grudem's definition. Or if you are a dispensationalist, maybe uh, ever since uh, Pentecost or something like that. But similar, just universal church being the spiritual body, not, not in a local area. But what is a local church? What is a local church? You need to understand what a local church is so that you can serve your church better. So what makes this group of people? What defines a local church? We know it's not a building, right? This is not a church. This is not Bethany Baptist Church. This building is not Bethany Baptist Church. It's the building that Bethany Baptist Church uses. So what, it's, we say, well, it's the people, right? And then we ask, you have to ask this question. If it's the people, what defines that group of people? What makes that people the church versus this group of people right here? Or a group that meets a small group of your, of your church family? Or a, a campus Bible study? What makes that group of people a church that you're calling that a local church, but not smaller groups within that group? or other groups where they mix with other groups. What makes that the group called the local church? Now, one of the things you're gonna notice here among the preachers here and all the pastors here is we don't agree on everything. So we're gonna step on each other's toes a little bit, and that's great. What we wanna model, what I hope for us to model here is a spirit of love and unity with a spirit of robust convictions and disagreements and humility to learn from each other and be challenged by each other, okay? So we're all gonna do that here. We, we wanna be challenged by the word every time. So. What defines this group of people? Is it the leadership? Some actually function like that. Well, the reason why they're one church is because they have a shared senior pastor or a shared senior staff, even if they don't share maybe campus staff or um, service staff or, or something like that. It's what makes that group one group? Well, they have the same leadership. That's the unifying factor. Others might say it's the administration. Others might say it's the budget. Well, you have shared finances. So, so we might have multiple whatever, but we all share finances, so we are one church. That might be true. Presbyterians call it the Presbyterian Church of America, singular. Um, but as a Southern Baptist, we call it the Southern Baptist Convention. It's a convention of churches. It's not the Southern Baptist Church. There is no the Southern Baptist Church. There are only 47,000 of them. But there's not one Southern Baptist Church. Because our polity understands that the church is not defined by shared money. Just because you share money for world missions and seminaries doesn't mean you're a church. What about a building? Well, they share space. We have a Spanish church that meets here. Some might say, oh, it's a Spanish service. No, we're very clear. It's a Spanish church that meets here. Different church altogether, defining the group differently. And then um, some might say, well, maybe the church is the regular gathering when you get together regularly. That might be true. I mean, that certainly is true of a church that they gather together regularly, but you can do that in small groups, can't you? And you could do that even in your campus Bible study every week, weekly gathering. So, so regular gathering doesn't make a church a church. What makes a church a local church? Jonathan Lehman says, a local church is, I'll give you his definition and I'll give you mine, okay? Here's Jonathan Lehman's definition, and I wanna break it down even further from his. His is, a local church is a group of Christians who regularly gather to proclaim the gospel. And he puts in parentheses, confession. They have a confession. They regularly proclaim the gospel they affirm one another by the ordinances. He calls that constitution. They affirm one another by the ordinances, baptism and Lord's Supper, and they live together as a family of God. And under that, it's covenant. So confession, constitution, covenant. They have a, a, a gospel proclamation. They have ordinances to constitute who they are, and they live together as a family of God around a covenant. 
My question to Jonathan Lehman's great definition is this. I want to just go even one step more fundamental. What makes it, what, what about this group makes them gather, proclaim, and affirm and live together? What's a, what is it about that group that makes them do all those four things? Why do they gather regularly? Because weekly Bible studies do that. Why do they proclaim the gospel? Why do they affirm each other's Christianity through the ordinances? And why do they live together? I'm trying to go one step funda more fundamental to Jonathan Lehman's definition. And so here's my definition. Okay? The local church is a group of Christians, a group of those in Christ, who are responsible for each other's discipleship collectively and individually in order to disciple their neighbors and the nations. Ross, can you grab that whiteboard, brother, and just put it right here? I wrote the definition on there so you guys could see it. Just flip it around, put it right over here. I'll say it again, and then you can see it there. A local church has four elements here. The local church is a group of people. It's not a building. It's not a leadership. It's not a budget. It's a group of people. A group of people professing faith in Christ. They're a group of those in Christ. Just put it right against the stage. Oh, that's good right there. That's fine. Is that okay for you guys? Everyone can see that? A group of those in Christ, um, fully responsible or responsible for each other's discipleship collectively and individually in order to disciple their neighbors and the nations. So this is different than this is different than those other groups, Bible study groups. And I think this is maybe at the heart of why, uh, why Jonathan Lehman would say that they confess something together, they proclaim the gospel, they constitute around the ordinances. I, I would put that all right here. And because, uh, and, and why do they, um, what was the third one? Constitution and live together as a family. So that's also right here. Actually, I think all of them, in one sense, if you had to, the one that's good for you, because number one and two, you guys don't need, I'm going to review that biblically, basically. But you already know one and two, right? Everyone knows that the church is not a building, but it's a group of people, right? And it's a group of Christians, right? We all, we're all okay there. I'm going to give you a few verses there just to show that it is biblical. But this right here, I think, is the sticking point. Number three, I think, is the sticking point, at least in the circles of evangelicalism I run in, in terms of their problems with understanding what the church is. And everyone understands the mission is to make disciples, so who do you disciple? Your neighbors and the nations. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love them without the gospel being central to that love. And um, you want to ripple effect to all the unreached and reached ethnic people groups of the world, right? All right. So number three is a sticking point, but let me just do a little bit of groundwork on one and two just to prove what you already know, that it's biblical, because I do still have 17 minutes. But maybe I won't need it all. Okay. So the local church is a group of people. God made Adam, and he made him alone. And he said, it's not, for, it's not good for man to be alone. So he made a helper for him to, to fulfill the commission of working and tilling the garden, to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Does that mean that only single, I mean, only married Christians can live out the essence of that today? Yes or no? Are, are single Christians incomplete and unable to live out, let's say, the cultural mandate? Yes or no? How many say yes? Raise your hand. How many say no? Raise your hand. All right, good, yeah, no. They're not. So in other words, um, when we say it's not good for man to be alone, we're not saying now that that means everyone needs to be married, right? What we're saying though, or at least what I'm saying from that is, it's still not good for man to be alone even if you're single. God made you for community. God made you to fulfill the cultural mandate of being fruitful, multiplying, filling the earth, and subduing it with other people. You can't do it by yourself. You need other people by definition. And if the Great Commission is somehow a new, covenant, a new covenantizing of that great cultural mandate into making disciples of all nations, if that's how you're being fruitful and multiplying, by making disciples of all, all nations, if that's somehow connected to it, then certainly we would say that... Um, Christians can do it, every single Christian can do it, and they can't do it by themselves. If you're going to teach them to obey everything Christ commanded, there's so many one another's, there's so many love your neighbors, there's so much, so many responsibilities, you can't obey, obey or teach someone to obey all that Christ commanded without other people. It's impossible. I am a man. I can't teach women all how to obey everything Christ commanded for women. But even if I was a single man with my church family, we can disciple women. Couldn't we? We could. And so... Um, Adam, God made Eve for Adam to fulfill the mission 
Okay, in Genesis 12, God called Abraham out of um, Ur of the Chaldees, as the King James Version says, still there in my memory. Ur of the Chaldees calls, calls him out from there, and he says that he will make him a blessing, or he will bless him and make him a nation. And through him, all the families of the earth will be blessed through a nation. So there's a corporate identity there. Um, when God saves them out of Egypt, he doesn't just save Moses or just one Israelite. He saves all of the people. Uh, we might debate whether how Jesus fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament in Israel or for Israel. But when Jesus died, this is not debated, he died. And when he goes up to heaven and ascends, he sends his Holy Spirit to a new covenant people and they become the body of Christ, right? We all agree there, that the, that the church becomes the body of Christ. Christ ascends, he des the spirit descends, and the church becomes the body of Christ. It's a body of people. It's a people, so the body of Christ is not you as an individual. You can't be the church by yourself. You can't be the body of Christ by yourself. You can be a member of the body, a part of the body. That's what we mean by member, not club membership, but if I cut my hand off, you'd be dismembered. That's what we mean by member, that you're a part of the body. So a body part, um, you can't be the body by yourself. The hand is not the body or the feet are not the body. So to state the obvious, the church is a group of people and not an individual, right? Fundamental. The word church means, there's three ways you could translate the word church, ecclesia. Assembly, congregation, or gathering. There's probably a few others, but those would be the the normal ways to assembly, congregation, gathering, that has the idea of more than one person gathering or assembling or congregating, okay? So that's why some people might argue for single service only churches or whatever the case, and we could talk about that if you guys want later. But that's what the word church means. All right, that's point one. The local church is a group of people. Secondly, the local church is a group of people professing faith in Christ. The local church is a group of people professing faith in Christ. Over and over, Paul makes this point again and again. He says in first, 2 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, local church, people who are in Christ, united to Christ, they're Christians, to the saints in Christ at Colossae, local church, people in Christ at a certain location, so if you are a Christian, you're in Christ. And to be in Christ, um, you know, we're only called Christian three times in the New Testament. We're, we're, we're called in Christ dozens of times, several times. That would be the one New Testament label for Christian if you had to pick one, those who are in Christ. I'm not gonna take the time here, but you can look at Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. It talks about, it says we're in Christ, I don't know, 10 times in 12 verses. But basically, it's we're elected by the Father in Christ, we're redeemed by the Son in Christ, and we are sealed by the Spirit in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, a wealth of insight and riches in that passage. I encourage you to meditate on that. But just circle the words it says, in him and in Christ or in the beloved one, and you'll see that the church are those who are united to Christ. God made him who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that in him, in him, united to him, we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21. So it's the group of people who are, who are Christ has taken their sin. And um, it's the group of people where Christ was the propitiation, paying the wrath of God for their sins, for the sins of his people. And they become the righteousness of God in Christ. We might argue for imputation from passages like 2 Corinthians 5.21 and Romans 5. 11 to 21 or so. But the point here is if you're united in Christ, we sing so um, readily, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Not only did he wash it, he gives us his righteousness. How do you become one who's in Christ? By what? How do you become united to Christ? By what? Faith. Faith alone and Christ alone, right? By faith. So you are saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not from works so that no one can boast. You are united to Christ through faith. Now, not everyone who says they're in Christ is in Christ. Not everyone who says they're a Christian is a Christian. That's why it says professing, right? I, I did write in parentheses there. It's a group of those locally, group of people professing to be in Christ. They profess to be in Christ. We can have, there could be people in this picture right here Right now, a lot of these are still members of our church who are not actually in Christ right now. They're just professing to be in Christ. But as far as we know, 
we're taking them as a credible profession. So they're part of the church locally. And so um, it's a profession of faith in Christ, but it's very important, brothers and sisters, that you keep teaching your people to check whether they're really of the faith. And it's very important for you as a pastor when you oversee the church to make sure you're not taking in people into the church who don't have a credible profession of faith. Now, there's two errors here that I don't have time to get into. You can be too rigorous with church membership or it can take, it's, it's too much. You almost have to be an elite Christian to be a member. That's, that's an error, I would say. We could talk about that in the panel. The other side of it is it's just, in our church before, is literally you walk down the aisle right there. At the end, I was doing altar calls here for my first year here, guys, just so you're aware of what's going on in this church um, or what was going on. But yeah, if you came in to the front, I had to do that. And then um, you'd sign a card. And if you checked off you want to be a Christian, sometimes the church would vote right there to take you in as a member. And I was like, whoa, I can't do that. But uh, I couldn't do it here. I couldn't go that far for them. But um, the point is you need to be careful because if this... If this is the church, the body of Christ, temple of the Holy Spirit, and they are trying to disciple their neighbors and the, and the nations and be responsible for each other's discipleship, and they don't have the Holy Spirit in them, and they don't have the word of God written on their hearts, are they going to help the church's mission or hurt it? They're going to hurt it big time. That's like putting bad gasoline in your engine. It's going to jam it up. So, again, you can't be omniscient, but you need to do the best you can within reason and time to let Christians in and only those who have a credible profession of faith. All right, let's move on to the sticking point. It's a group of people in Christ. Here it is, responsible for one another's discipleship collectively, both collectively and individually. Let's do the individual first. That's easy, right? And what does it mean to be responsible for each other's discipleship? It means that we're responsible not only for our own personal growth. Your members aren't responsible for their own personal growth. They're responsible for the growth of those around them. So we have two members here from... Christian Fellowship Bible Church, Abram and Benzer, you are responsible for Abram's growth, and Abram, you're responsible for Benzer's growth. That's just what it means to be part of the body. You are responsible for each other's discipleship. That's what the Great Commission is, take, you know, teaching them to obey everything Christ commanded. You're, you're, you're responsible first for your own growth, then for the growth of others. What do I mean by you're responsible for your own growth? When our child was a newborn, she had a responsibility. Cry when you're hungry. Cry when you're sleepy and cry when your diaper needs to be changed. When the, when the, when the food is in your mouth, eat it and um, go to sleep when you're tired. That's their job. And grow every day. Your job is to grow up. We'll give you the food. We'll give you a bed. We'll change your diapers. Your, that's our job. Your job is to grow. Every Christian's job is to grow personally in Christ. If you have life, you have growth. If you don't have life, you don't have growth. You're responsible to grow. If you're part of a local church, you are fully responsible for your own Christian growth, but you're also responsible for the growth of those around you. That's why pastors are called in Ephesians 4.11 to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Because if you read on in Ephesians 4, it says, equip the saints for the work of ministry. Look at Ephesians 4, if you could turn there briefly. So pastors are equipping the saints, but they're not doing the work of the ministry per se. In Ephesians 4.11, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity, we, the church, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. We won't be tossed to and fro. Verse 15, how are they doing this? How is the church doing this? But speaking the truth in what? By, but speaking the truth in love, let us, church, grow in every way into him who is the head of Christ. So the church is to speak the truth in love to each other. You are called, pastor, to equip your members to speak the truth in love to each other, to encourage, to rebuke, to correct, to train in righteousness, to sit and be silent when they're bereaved, to not be a miserable comforter, and then to be a faithful warner when they need to be warned. All right, that's your responsibility. Um, let's move on here uh, to the corporate. I got six minutes here, all right? Um, every individual is um, responsible for each other's growth. I said that love one another as I have loved you. By this, all men are to know you're my disciples by your love for each other, John 13, 34, and 35. So you're to love each other and help each other grow. But not only individually, I would argue, if you're gonna follow and obey all of the New Testament, you have to help each other grow collectively as a group. Now, it's sad that I only have like two minutes to say this because this is a sticking point, but let me, we'll, we'll do panels and we'll, uh, the other guys are gonna preach and that's gonna be helpful as well. But let me say this. Here are three ways we can summarize corporate responsibility or collective responsibility. I could do it in three words, but two of them I made up. I'll give you the one I didn't make up, excommunication. That's a third word. Let me give you the two other words, 
incommunication, recommunication, and excommunication. Incommunication, recommunication, excommunication. Let's start with excommunication. That's not controversial here, I hope. Matthew 18, 15 through 20. Tell your brother once, rebuke him in private, doesn't listen, take two or three with you, 18, 16. And then 18, 17 says this, if he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church leaders. No, it doesn't say church leaders. Tell the church board. It doesn't say tell the church board. It says tell the church. Gentlemen, what is a church? When it says tell the church, what does that mean? What does the word church mean? Fundamentals. It's fundamental. Tell it to the church. Teach them to obey everything Christ commanded. He commanded you to tell the church. What is a church? You need to know. If he doesn't pay attention to the church, because the church knows and the church is pursuing them, let him be like a Gentile and tax collector to you. All right, so there's excommunication. I won't argue more for that, but that's a corporate responsibility. That's the difference between a campus Bible study and a church. Campus Bible studies don't excommunicate. Me and Bobby and um, Anthony Kidd and Matt Jones, we're friends. We might rebuke each other if we catch each other. We might plead with each other, but we can't excommunicate from our friendships. There's no formal excommunication. There's no collective responsibility among even us here. I, I, I think most of you here are my friends. A lot of you guys here I already know and we're friends. But even as a group of friends, Gospel Coalition LA or whatever, we don't have a collective responsibility. The church does, though. That's the difference. The local church has a collective responsibility that other groups don't have for excommunication. But let me give you the other two. Incommunication. What's incommunication? That's how you take them. So excommunication is you're exiting them from the communion, the visible communion of the saints. They are being excommunioned. They are no longer part of the group of those who are professing faith in Christ, who are collectively and individually responsible for each other's discipleship to disciple the neighbors and the nations. They're, not, they're no longer part of that group anymore. They have been excommunicated. That doesn't say, that's not saying they're not a Christian. It's not a credible profession. So that's why our church withdraws our affirmation. Okay, that's excommunication. That's going out. But what about coming in? How do we come into the church? How does someone join into, into this? How does someone become part of this? Well, actually, now I'm realizing I got kids here who are not part of the church in one sense, but that's, a, that's another discussion. But how does one who's a professing Christian become part of this? How do, how do they become part of this? That's the process of membership. But what, what's our sign for someone coming in to the communion? Baptism. So when you look at this group, I mean, just think about it. I was thinking about this last night. All of these members, not the kids, but all of these up here, all of these members have passed through the waters of baptism. Is that a sweet thought? Like, as I look at all of the members, this is like two or three years ago now, but as I look at the members of our church, every single one of them have passed through the waters of baptism. That's how they came in, in communication. That's why membership and baptism are tied together. We can talk about that during the panel q if you like as well. In the Bible church tradition, that has been severed. That's in communication. And then recommunication. How do we renew our communion of the saints? How do we recommunicate? How do we recommunion? We take what? Communion. We take communion. And so in our church, we say, um, if you're not a Christian, if you're, if you're not a Christian, refrain from taking it. If you are a Christian but you haven't been baptized or you're not currently a member of a local church that preaches the same gospel you heard preached here, we ask you to refrain from taking communion. But if you're a Christian here or a Christian from another church and that church affirms you and it's a gospel preaching church and you're a part of that church publicly, then we welcome you to our communion this morning. Because it's not about private affirmation of your faith. It's a public affirmation of your faith. And communion is a re-communicating of that communion we have. Because it's not just Bethany Baptist Church. We're in communion with all of you guys if you're members of a church that's also gospel preaching. So if Alex Hong comes to our church, we're, we're, in this, we're in the communion of saints. We're part of the universal church together. And we're both publicly manifest at Christian Fellowship Bible Church, West Covina, and at Bethany Baptist Church in Bellflower. So I don't mind sharing the table with him. All right, 30 seconds. Recommunication. I'm not going to talk about the mission, but you guys could see it there. Let me just say this as I close. Okay, 20 seconds. Here's what the other brothers are going to point out now. They're going to point out this from this church. From the church, we're, getting, we're talking about what is a healthy church. But before you talk about what a healthy church is, you need to know what a church is. What are, we, what are we trying to make healthy? And so I would just argue that a healthy church is Christ-centered and Christ-shaped. What I mean by, and they'll, they'll, we'll uncover some of that. Christ-centered means there's exposit, 
from the center of the church, expository preaching, biblical theology, systematic theology, a regular uh, understanding of the gospel message, an understanding of conversion. That's the center of what keeps the church strong and renewed over and over and over again. That's the center of the church. But the shape of the church is the outside. Is it a circle or a square? That's, you're talking about borders now. What's the shape of the church? That's the structure. That's the membership of a church. That's the discipline of a church. That is the leadership of the church and the... Um, and the structures of the church for discipleship, your Sunday gatherings and whatever meetings you have as a church, that's the skin and the outside of a church. And, and, and that also has to be healthy. If you're gonna have a healthy church, you need a, a, a healthy center in Christ and a healthy shape on the outside. All right, I'm done, let me close.